So I have these going back to back. All right. So we're going to start this session on the pro features of Zoom. These are the ones that I think teachers are really looking to use potentially in their classes or that they saw and they weren't sure if they could use it. And they wanted a little more information. So the features that I have on the agenda to discuss today are the in-meeting toolbar, recording your meetings, breakout rooms, polls, sharing screens, and within sharing screens, we'll look at annotations, the whiteboard, and remote control. So those are the things we'll be looking at today. Most of the rest of what you do in Zoom is pretty much the basic, um, the basic features of, you know, you present and talk and so on, and your students are listening, and your students also have some opportunity to interact with you you might have noticed that how that looks for students does depend on the device they're using. So many of our students use Chromebooks. So if they use Chromebooks, oops, yeah, like my reactions button went away because apparently I don't have room for it anymore. Um, sometimes, oops, sometimes your students' reactions buttons aren't visible. So I know some teachers have been asking their kids, okay, click on reactions and then choose either thumbs up or applause. And the students are like, but I don't have it. That could very well be true. For example, currently in my toolbar, not the one I gave you a picture of here, but the one that's showing today, I don't have reactions. Now, I don't have reactions because I'm the host, but students on Chromebooks don't see reactions. That doesn't mean they can't answer your question though. It means that they need to click on participants and you can do this too. Click on the word participants in your little Zoom tools at the bottom and underneath the list of participants, you'll see the words yes or no, go slower and go faster, and then you'll see more. And if you click on, if you hover over more, you'll see thumbs up, thumbs down, applause, coffee, meaning I need a break, please stop talking. <laughs> and the little clock, meaning I'm away right now. Okay, so these are the interaction buttons that generally speaking, your students can use to respond to questions that you ask or to give you feedback. So I'm sorry, Nicole, they do have this on the Chromebook then? My understanding is yes, if they click on participants, they should still see it. However, there is another complication with Chromebooks. Okay. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and it could depend on how they're joining your meeting. So Chromebooks have a Zoom extension and a Zoom app. The students who join with that are able to click, the, my understanding is they can click these participant reaction buttons if they use the Zoom extension or the Zoom app to join from the Chromebook. There is also a, a way in that lets them join with what's called browser link. That's not just the link you put in with the password. It's like a special workaround um, for people whose app isn't working for whatever reason. Well, it is kind of a low function of Zoom. It's like a minimalist version of Zoom. And there are many things that don't work, including the participant reactions. Here's the catch. <laughs> and I knew this was definitely going to come up today anyway when we talked about breakout rooms. Here's the catch. Students on Chromebooks cannot join a breakout room if they use the Zoom, the Zoom app or extension in Chrome. I don't know why. Definitely not something we chose. It's a problem with Zoom. So normally, if there is an app, even for phones, right? If rather than go to Zoom on the web, you would use the Zoom app on your phone. The experience will be better. That's normally true. But for some reason, the Zoom app and extension for Chromebooks does not allow them to join a breakout room. So if you create breakout rooms, even if it says they're, they're listed in breakout room two, when you hit go, those kids aren't going anywhere. They're just gonna stay in the main room. So if you're doing breakout rooms, there's a way to have students join via browser link. And oddly enough, if they do that, they lose some other functionality in Zoom, but they can go to your breakout room. <laughs> Don't know why but it is something to be aware of. So how they come into Zoom from a Chromebook might be why they aren't seeing the interactions because they might be doing the join via browser link and it, is, it, it doesn't have all the functions. Okay. I know, sorry. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> yeah. yeah, 
I keep so, asking them to raise their hand and a lot of them can't figure it out. They're like, no, I can't raise my hand. So, <laughs> you know, in theory, as you're sitting now to raise your hand is a little bit different too, but the same thing applies. They're going to click on participant. They're going to find their name in the list and then um, they should have the option to raise their hand to the right of their name. So in theory, each of you should be able to raise your hand now because you should be able to find your name in the participant list, go to the right of it, and then raise your hand. I'm just looking at the participant list to see if anybody's trying it. <laughs> I can't raise my own hand because I'm the host, <laughs> so it won't let me. Perfect. I did see somebody do I it. I have my raised hand icon, Nicole, but it's oh. not to the right of my name. So, and is it, um, is the raised hand icon in your toolbar for Zoom or is it in participants? Uh, in participants next and to the yes button. And there's a little raised hand icon. Where yeah. is it located? Next to the left of the yes button. So oh, it goes raised hand, then, yes, yeah. no, yeah, go yeah. slower, go faster. Yep, yep, yep. Than okay, more. sorry. So raise hand is to the left of the yes. There we go. And in my, one of the resources in this slide deck, actually the only resource so far, um, is the kind of handbook for using Zoom. It, it actually talks about all of this. So you don't have to memorize any of this, but it actually has screenshots from kind of the participant perspective. And it has a screenshot of that area I just directed you to with the interaction buttons and the hand raise. So you actually can see that screenshot and you can show that to kids as far as like, you know, if you want to say, you know, click on participants and then you'll see this and you should see the raise hand or the yes or the no and so on. Um, again, for the Chromebooks, they might have to be sure that they're joining with the Zoom extension or, or app in order to have access to that in Chrome. Okay. Oops. There we go. Come on. Um, so your toolbar, the other one I wanted to share with you before we dive into the features from the, um, well, this is the in-meeting toolbar, but before we dive into the other features is the security tool, which many of you noticed last spring because it's something that Zoom added right after K-12 schools started using Zoom and started having some trouble with it. So Zoom programmers immediately added this functionality that gives you the chance to, on the fly, adjust certain permissions. Now here's the trick. What shows up here when you click on it might vary because it depends on what things you have turned on or off in your settings in Zoom as well. So if you have chat turned off in, in your settings, it won't show up here for you to turn it back on you have to have chat turned on in settings in order to be able to manage what kind of access to chat your participants have once your meeting starts. For example, you turn on chat in your settings and that means they can chat with virtually everybody, but you can then come into Zoom and you can either click the security icon and just turn off chat and turn it back on later, or you can click on the chat icon and as the host of the meeting, you can actually designate if they can chat with everybody publicly and privately, if they can chat with people only publicly, or if they can only chat with you. Um, and you can do that from your chat icon, but not, a, not if the chat has been turned off. And you can turn it off, right? Like, for example, if you're just doing your lesson and People and then you've decided that's enough with the chat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's when you'd want to hit the security icon because mm -hmm. that this is just an on off. The check mark means it's on. Click it again. Okay. The check mark goes away and it's off. Awesome. Yeah. So you can turn that off from there if you have it turned on in settings. And then again, some like enable waiting room that won't be there anymore because it's on by default now. You don't need to enable it. Um, but whether or not, depending on if in your settings they can rename themselves, this might appear. Um, as it turns out, I did notice that that setting is locked to off right now. So people authenticate to join the meeting and the name that they authenticate with as part of their account in Zoom is their name for the meeting. Um, we may need to have a conversation between you know, teachers and us and technology services about whether or not we need to see if there's some flexibility there for students who have a need to be able to change their name. But for now, they cannot rename themselves. That was part of the purpose of authentication so that teachers could be sure that people are coming in as who they recognize. Um, 
The other things is you'll see in your toolbar, obviously you have your microphone and your video. If you've never played with it, start a meeting for yourself one day and click the up arrow next to your video and you'll see another way to get to a bunch of settings, including some of your, not just your video settings, but others. Um, if your polls are turned on, as you'll see in a little while later in your settings, then you have access to polls in your meeting. Your record button might be visible here. However, I have found that since I took this screenshot, my toolbar has collapsed and instead there's a little three dots and more off to the right and I have to click there to get to my record button um, and, and to get to my breakout rooms as well. So just know that technology kind of fluctuates and varies a lot by its nature, especially online technology. And if a feature you had, like let's say today you looked and you saw breakout rooms and tomorrow you open Zoom and you don't see it anymore, go to the right of your toolbar and it would be over here, but it, I don't have it right now on this one because everything was showing. And you will see another thing that just says three dots and the word more and click there and you'll see your breakout rooms, the ability to record your meetings and so on. So let's talk a little bit about recording. You can record to two places. You can record to the cloud. That means that you would go to your Zoom account online and on the left-hand menu, one of the options is recordings. That's where your recording will be. They will give you a link that you can share. However, if you're going to be doing recording and sharing recordings frequently, I would recommend you download those recordings or don't record to the cloud at all because you have limited storage space and then you'll end up having to move them anyway. So I used to record to the cloud in Zoom and I've stopped. I just record to my computer because even the ones in Zoom, I had to download to my computer so I could re-upload them to YouTube or teachers would want to re-upload them to Google Drive. So I figured I might as well save a step and just have it on my computer to begin with. But in your settings online at sanjuan.zoom.us, you can decide if your recordings go to your desktop or if they go to the cloud. And cloud means that they're in your Zoom online set, uh, your Zoom online account. Desktop means they're gonna go into a folder that Zoom creates for you. Um, on your desktop so that you can manage them from there. You should always announce when you're recording a meeting. I did make a quick announcement. You might not have heard it, but I am recording this meeting <laughs> and this meeting recording will be added to these slides so that you can review the recording. Um, you can pause and record, you can pause your recording rather and resume at any time. This is particularly helpful if you have breakout rooms because you can't record the breakout rooms anyway. So you might as well avoid having a five minute long gap in your recording where nothing's happening by pausing the recording until your students come back to the main room. Your recording um, will be saved to the hard drive on your device unless you chose to save it to the cloud, but I recommend you just go ahead and tell Zoom in your account settings that you want it to save to your hard drive. And then you can upload it to Google Drive to get a link that you can share with others. Um, in my case, I also, I upload my trainings to YouTube, but you have student students on there and you can do a private link on YouTube, um, but you might find it a little bit better to just put it in your drive. And then do not post the recordings in a public place. So they should be behind a locked wall, like your Google Classroom um, Seesaw, because you need account like password information to get in and that protects them. It's also a good idea to remind students and families that it's not okay for them to share the recordings either. They don't have the permission to do that um, because it was intended for their use to review the lesson or because they were absent and their use only. And this is just a reminder that you can save your meetings to the cloud or to the desktop. I recommend the desktop. Are there any questions about recording, if any of you have tried this yet or ran into a question? Doesn't recording on your desktop overwhelms your computer and takes a lot of space as well? It could, but you can get rid of the recordings after you've uploaded them to wherever you need them to be. Okay. So in order, you aren't going to be able to send, um, that's a good question, because let's say a student was absent and you want to send them the video. Mm -hmm. Even if the video is on your desktop, you can't email it to them because it's just too big. It won't work. So you're still going to have to upload it to something where it will turn your recording into a link. Like Google Drive. Like Google Drive. And then you can take it off of your desktop. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about recording? 
Is there some kind of security that parents have to sign? Because sometimes you see all kinds of things in Zoom that I know. you don't want to post out there. <laughs> um, we do not have anything currently that parents have to sign, neither for their students to be in Zoom. They technically, our district is an opt out district, meaning that by attending schools in our district, our students have implicitly opted in to the technologies that we have provided for them. Um, so they also agree implicitly through the student handbook and um, when they sign their emergency cards and confirm that they've read the student handbook, they agree implicitly to our use, our appropriate use guidelines for um, data information from the internet, how they themselves as students, you know, behave on the internet is all part of our acceptable use policy and that's outlined in their handbook. Well, it doesn't always work that way. Parents I know. Up in front of the screen and say all kinds of things. So it doesn't always work. However, out. it is helpful to know that it is outlined and that is something that you and your administration can use when you need to have a conversation with families about the kind of language and content that your students are posting. We do have it outlined. It is outlined in writing that it is not appropriate and that there can be consequences for that behavior. Just like, you know, we know that's not appropriate, but kids in our physical classrooms blurt out swear words sometimes, right? They, it's, it's very similar to that. And what we do, we need to treat it the same, the same way where if that happens and we need to have a conversation with the student or if it's more egregious and we need to bring in a counselor or an administrator and the family, whatever we need to do to support the student to make those better choices. Well, in this case, we're talking parents being inappropriate. Not oh. <laughs> oh, sadly. Okay. Well, <laughs> it does happen. I know. Um, I would, if there's something happening and particularly fits with the same family, I'm, my, my initial feeling would be to have a conversation with my administrator. We did. We did. Okay. Have they been able to provide any assistance? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. That would have been my first, my first reaction. Sorry, I was actually, I, I missed that. I was really thinking about the students. Okay. It was a sorry, not sorry situation, but we moved on. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Hopefully that won't happen again. My goodness. Um, breakout rooms are allowed. I reconfirmed this because originally one of the older SLAs for teachers said that you couldn't do breakout rooms unless you had an adult available for each room. Um, that was partially in response to our very abrupt and not prepared for exit from school and entrance into this remote learning situation and distance learning. And so, you know, we're like, we know that there, there could be an issue. This was very sudden and so on. But now that people are doing distance learning basically full time, the district leadership and SJTA recognized that teachers need more flexibility in the kinds of things they can do to engage their learners. So breakout rooms are allowed. You do need to know that, yes, there, that doesn't mean there isn't an issue with breakout rooms. Um, a breakout room is like leaving a classroom with no teacher in it. You can't be in all the breakout rooms at once. You can drop in on all of them, right, as the, as the host, but you can't see or hear all of them at the same time. But if once you and your class have not only agreed to some norms for the kinds of behavior we're going to engage in and the language we're going to use in our classrooms, and once you and the class have come to a point where you feel like an opportunity for them to work in small groups is not only appropriate, but something that you can count on them to do responsibly, if you would like to use breakout rooms, you can. You are not required to. Um, but since you do have that option, I wanted to give you some guidance on how the breakout rooms work. This goes back to what I said earlier about Chromebooks. Your students who are on Chromebooks cannot, and this is very unusual, they cannot use the Zoom extension or the Zoom app to join your meeting if they need to go to a breakout room because the Zoom app and the Zoom extension will not let them go. They have to join with a browser link instead. And I have that in the using Zoom document, but I can go grab that screenshot really quickly <clears throat> if you need to see it. So first of all, you have to have breakout rooms enabled in your Zoom settings because you can turn them off and just never use them. So if you think you'd like to use them, it's a good idea to go to your Zoom settings and make sure your breakout rooms are turned on. Then 
you could create breakout rooms in advance. What that would require is you kind of putting in exactly the students as they come, the way they come into Zoom, like with their student email addresses, and you could actually pre-assign them to breakout rooms so that you don't have to do it on the fly. But you can also start a meeting on the fly during, sorry, you can start a breakout room on the fly during your Zoom meetings, and then you can tell Zoom how many breakout rooms you would like. So you can see in the screenshot here, I had six participants and I could break them into two rooms, but there's a little up or down arrow. I can choose three rooms. I can choose six rooms and have every student be in a room on their own so that I can drop in and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. That's also something I can do. The limit on the number of breakout rooms is 50. So that will more than cover any of our classes. I can also have Zoom create the rooms automatically, meaning it's just gonna grab the list of people and break them up into the rooms. Or I can tell Zoom, no, no, let me decide who goes to what room. Okay, and then I click create breakout rooms. Once I do that, it's going to let me rename each room by hovering over the title. And there'll be lists, as you can see in the shot on the right, there's lists of who's in each room. If I hover on someone's name, I can either exchange them with another participant in another room, or I can just physically move them to room number two or room number four, whatever I would like to do. Once I send them off to their rooms, I still have a list of who's in each room and I have a join button so that I can join any of the rooms. Once I am in the room, I have to click the leave button and then I have to be careful because when I click leave, it's going to give me the option to end the meeting or just leave the breakout room. So you wanna be sure you leave the breakout room and don't just end the meeting unless you wanted to. And that'll send me back to my main room and I have to click on breakout rooms again and it'll give me the list and then I can click join to go to the next room. So there's a little bit of clicking because you end up like you go to a room, you leave the room, it sends you back to the main room, you go to your little Zoom toolbar, click breakout rooms, join a different room, leave that room, go back to the main room and so on. You'll notice at the bottom there's a thing that allows you to broadcast a message to every room. It's not very big. It's a little bit small, but a pop-up will appear with whatever message you want to send them. Like, hey, two minute warning. Sadly, if you put a hyperlink in the message, it's not a link and they can't copy it. So don't try to send a link that way. I've already tried that. It didn't work. Um, but if you just want to send them some information, you can click broadcast a message to all and it will let you send a message to the group. Your groups should be able to request your assistance as well. Um, they can like send, you'll get a little pop-up that says breakout room three needs your assistance and you can go there. And then finally, when you're meeting, when you're done with the breakout rooms, click close all rooms. But do know this, no matter what you try to do, it will always give them 60 seconds to come back. There's no quick end button that just yanks everybody back to the main room. They have 60 seconds and they either float back in over the 60 seconds or at the end of 60 seconds, anybody who has not returned from the breakout room will be yanked into the main room. So I tend to click my end meeting button or my, sorry, not end meeting, excuse me, my close all rooms button one minute early. So that that 60 seconds is this part of the 60 seconds I had already counted on for the amount of time that the breakout room was going to last because it's going to give them 60 seconds to come back. Any questions about breakout rooms? Okay. I don't know if you've tried a poll yet. So one of the things I wanted to show you here is that you're seeing a couple of things. These are actually in my settings in Zoom. The first one is the actual setting for polls. In my account, that has to be turned on or I do not have access to polls no matter when I want them. Then within a meeting, um, this is in my personal meeting room. I will exit out actually and show you because um, it looks different for different meetings. So if I go to sanjuan.zoom.us and I sign in, just like your kiddos are doing now, 
and I go to my San Juan account. Okay. Your account always opens on your meeting page and you'll see that I have upcoming meetings Right, I just I scheduled a whole series of recurring meetings in case I need to model anything. Um, so let's say I go to edit. If I go to edit all occurrences, this one should allow me then to add. No, I don't see it. Sorry, not seeing it there. One of the tricks I've been finding is it's been difficult for me to find. Well, we'll be able to start polls um, from the meeting room, but I'm going to show you from my personal room in case you're using that. Then you have details. That's details of my meeting. Poll takes me to my personal meeting room polls. And here, and this is the screenshot you see in my slide deck, I have one poll that I've already created, which I can edit or delete, or I can click add poll. And when I click to add poll, it allows me to choose a question. Um, I already have that question. Um, it's your favorite. I'm not, a, I'm not in the mood to ask a deep philosophical question. So morning beverage. And then I can put in options and I'm going to change it from untitled to choose. It doesn't tab. So for those of you who are like me, who like to tab to the next one, it doesn't do that. So don't try. Well, you could try, but it's still not going to work. Copy, add option. T, add option, water, right? And then I can even add another, oh, this is important actually. This requires them to make a single choice and multiple choice means that they can choose more than one answer. And there is a subtle difference that I don't know if you've ever noticed, but in any form, this is true in Google Forms, most online forms that you run across and here, if the answer is a circle, it means you can only choose one. If the answer choices are a square, it means you can check as many as you'd like. So that's just something you can teach students as well. If they're always, if they're confused about whether they can choose one or more than one, usually a circle means you can only choose one and a square checkbox means that you can check as many as you'd like. You can add more options, obviously. Um, you can copy that question as the framework for another question, or you can hit add question. And then you can add multi another question if you'd like, but I'm going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, I'm going to delete that question. And notice here I have it set as anonymous, but if there's a reason why you would need to know who answered what, you could just uncheck that. And now you would actually be able to get data later in your reports on who answered what. And then I can save. So now within my meeting, I'm going to go back to my Zoom slide because you can't see when I'm presenting, you can't ever see my toolbar even if I share my screen. Zoom won't show it to you. So within my meeting, I'm going to click polling to launch the poll. It's going to bring up my poll questions and then it's going to give me the launch poll button. So if I were to do that now, I'm going to click polling and I have two polls to choose from. So I'm going to go to the one you just saw me type. I, you can't see what I just did, but I selected the poll that I just created. As you can see here, there is an edit button. It does not edit in this window. It brings you back to your Zoom settings to edit, just so you know. And the only reason I mention that is I find that to be a little bit clunky. It slows me down just a hair compared to just letting me open it and edit it right here where it is. So I'm going to hit launch poll and you should, you should be seeing a question. Now it's saying untitled question, but it was, what is your favorite morning beverage? And you can't see the answers yet, but I can see that answers are coming in. Well, you might be able to see them with my shared screen, but I don't think you can. <laughs> okay. And I had set it up to where you can choose as many as you'd like. So if you drink multiple things in the morning, for example, I tend to drink both coffee and juice, although I only drink decaf, um, you can actually select multiple things. Now let's say I'm done with that. We're done with the poll. I'm gonna hit end poll. And now it's going to give me the option to share the results with you. So you can't see it yet, but I have two options here. One is to share the results and the other is to relaunch the poll and ask the questions again. So I'm going to share the results 
And now in theory, you should be able to see the responses of the poll as well, not just me. So you should be able to see that there were um, three responses for coffee and one response for tea. And we don't know if that person who said tea is, is a different person from any of those who said coffee, or if it's one of the people who said coffee also happens to like tea. Now I can stop sharing and I'm not going to relaunch. So I clicked on polling. Be, at the time that I did this screenshot, I only had one poll with two questions. But now that you saw me edit and create a new poll, there was a little down carrot right here that I clicked on and that got me to the poll that I did today. And I see that there's a question, I'll be right there. Um, then it shows me the in progress. You didn't see this while you were answering and nobody had answered yet. And then the poll is closed and I have the option to share results or to launch it again and get more answers. So let me grab that question. Where would I access? Oh, thank you, Elaine. Perfect. Yes. So um, you can access, thank you, Elaine, also for, for answering the question about the participant list. Yes, you can access the reports in your Zoom account under reports and then choose meeting. And that's where you can get a few kinds of reports, including attendance. And I'll show you that screen in a second, actually, since I'm already there. Let me show you what that looks like. So if instead of meetings, I go to reports, you can see which ones do what. So usage report, view meetings, participants, and meeting minutes. Okay. Meeting, view the registration report and poll reports for the meetings. So if I click here, and I don't know if this one will process right now because, oh, it did. Um, I can generate a report of all registrants. Actually, I didn't choose poll. Sorry, that was dumb. Um, but let me go back to reports, meeting report. Hold on a second. Poll report. Let's try choosing that. Um, and it has to be a meeting that ended at least five minutes ago. So I'm going to choose, oh, it doesn't, oh, let me change the date. I can't remember. Let's try going all the way back to August 1 because I can't remember when I had a poll. Well, it's not going to tell me. Bummer. So you'll have to know the date. There's one other time where I ran the poll, but I don't remember what date that was. So I'm not going to be able to, um, I'm not going to be able to generate that poll report right now because I don't use it that often. And I really can't remember when I did that screenshot. So you would actually go to reports, meeting report, and it defaults to registration. That's not the one you want. You don't even have people registering advance, in advance for your meetings. You wanted the poll report. And then from there, check your dates. And then you have to find the one that corresponds with the start time and end time if you had multiple meetings on that date so that you could then click on generate to get your report. Mm -hmm. So Elaine caught my mistake as well. Make sure you click on poll report. Registration report, again, it's not going to give you any data at all. Um, we don't have registration turned on for our meetings. You don't require, they're not registering in advance, so that's not going to be helpful to you. Okay. okay. We're going to move into the sharing screens now, and there's a lot to talk about here because it's more than just sharing your screen. There's a whole bunch built into this capacity. When you first click to share your screen, which is, oh, sorry, which is your green button, your share screen button, you'll see a window and you'll know, you might have noticed, most people ignore this, but small things are not to be ignored on the internet. They always mean something. So this bright one means that you're on the basic page, but there's also an advanced page and you can share a file from your computer, which I've never needed to do, but you could. Um, in basic, you can share it. I happen to have a lot of tabs open when and things open rather when I clicked on this. So I had two instances of Google Chrome running. By the way, kind of a pro tip, I guess, from me. Um, if you're like me and you have lots and lots and lots and lots of tabs open in Chrome, because it's my to-do list, so I have a lot of things open. I have found it very helpful to grab just the things I need for my next Zoom meeting 
and pull them into another Chrome. I just open Chrome up. I actually, what I do is I um, go to the meeting where I go to my main Chrome where I already have it open as part of my to-do list. And I just drag the tab up and out and it pops open a new Chrome window and it puts it there. And I have found that to be very helpful in my case because I keep so many things open in my Chrome window that um, when I'm in a Zoom meeting, it, has, it can be distracting. So my Zoom meeting, that's why there's two Chromes here, only has the things I need to present to my group for that meeting. Everything else is still living in my main Chrome. Safari was open because I was doing something else in Safari. Um, but notice this is also where you get your whiteboard, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, some of you have an iPhone or an iPad and you can use AirPlay or the cable to share the screen from that if you want to share something from a mobile device. And very importantly, down at the bottom, if you're going to be sharing anything that plays audio. So Bianca, you are going to play music at the beginning of your meeting. You will want to be sure that you are sharing a screen for whatever picture or slides or whatever you want them to see first. And then share computer sound needs to be checked. That way the students don't hear a choppy, fading in and out, weird sound file. They'll actually get clear sound. If there's a video that you'll be playing during your Zoom meeting, you'll also want to check the box that says optimize screen share for video clip so that the video in, works as good as possible or as well as possible. If you look at advanced, you have some additional things. And the main one I wanted to draw your attention to, I did play with this. This is brand new. This just happened. Um, slides as virtual background. I don't think I like it very much, but basically it works with PowerPoint only. Um, and it shares your PowerPoint slides as if you were sharing a screen but it's your virtual background. So you're in the corner and parts of you are blinking in and out because it, that's what happens when you do virtual background. Um, I didn't like it very much, but it's something you can play with if you use PowerPoint. It doesn't work with anything else. If you have a document camera, notice that you default to basic, but there's an option for document camera on advanced. So you might wanna check there if you're going to be sharing content from a second camera, such as a document camera. I do know that there's been some glitchiness with the use of document cameras in Zoom and in my using Zoom for live interactions document, that's the how-to handbook for Zoom. There is a section specifically on document cameras and that shares like two different ways people have found success with document cameras, but certain brands seem to not work. Um, yes, if you are sharing video, Bianca, before you, before you choose the screen that you're going to be sharing, if your lesson includes video, normally what people do is they click on what they want to share and they just hit share and they ignore this lower left corner. You want to train yourself to click share computer sound and optimize for video and then hit share so that that will be better for you and for your learners actually. Can we share our screen and be able to see participants? A lot of people are using two screens. I have never been a, I've never been a dual monitor person, but a lot of people are doing dual monitors. Um, they're connecting their computers to their TVs with an HDMI cable. Um, you can join a meeting on two devices as long as you have one of the microphones mute, or if you've done so or are interested in doing so, you can just purchase a second monitor and attach it to your computer and you do extended displays and only one half is what you're actually projecting in Zoom and you can move the participants grid um, view off to the right hand, off to the extended part that they don't see so that you can see them. So there's a few different ways you can do that. Now, I was saying in a little a little bit ago that sharing your screen actually is a lot more than just letting other people see your screen. <laughs> I know. Allah, I feel like I should really just buy another monitor because so many people love it and I think it surprises people that I'm just not a fan, but feeling like I'm gonna have to start looking into it. <laughs> actually using a spare TV, so I see all the kids in one screen and yeah. I'm doing all my teaching from my Mac. 
Yeah, exactly. And that's what a lot of people are, are doing apparently. And in my case, it's just because it's easier for some of the work that I do, if I could have like certain screens open in one area and the work related to that in another screen, but maybe yeah, one day I'll give it a try. I seem to be looking a different way. I have a webcam and the Elma camera. It's like a podcast station. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. My, my closest thing is this is the best microphone ever. And this is how I this is how I do my meetings. So if we're going to connect, use the phone. if we're going to connect to, um, like, I have my personal laptop and then my work laptop. What is the cable then that we would need to connect those? Generally you know, speaking, you know? generally speaking, it would be HDMI. So I was just checking my MacBook. So mm -hmm. unless your laptop is very, very old, each of them should have an HDMI port. And you should okay. be able to get a dual sided, like just the way you connected like a Blu-ray player to your TV. There's an HDMI mm -hmm. on the back of your Blu-ray and there's an HDMI on your TV. And you just plug one end okay. into one and one end into the other. Um, then you have to do some manipulating, um, you know, as far as like, for example, if, if you want the Mac to be your base station, um, mm -hmm. I, had, I had just found and forwarded to someone some instructions about getting the dual monitors to work well in a Mac. So I can find those again mm -hmm. for you if you decide to do that. Yeah, I took my iPad in and my principal was going to try to set it up for me and she couldn't figure it out. Um, so... I don't know. It, you know. So, and you, you were trying to set it up from your Mac as kind of the main station, right? Yeah. Mac. I have a, two Macs. I have my oh, both personal. Mac. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. um, do me a favor, just because I know I'm not going to remember. Okay. Feel free to email me and tell me that you need me to send you the instructions for dual monitors on a Mac or dual display on a Mac. And I'll go look them up again. Thank you. <laughs> You're okay. welcome. Um, and then Bianca, you probably don't need to purchase a mic. Um, I have a couple of reasons. First of all, I already owned one because prior to the job I have now, even as a teacher, I was recording a lot of videos. And so I just went ahead and got myself a mic. Um, that's good for podcasting. It's also good for music and so on. But the other reason is I personally, I can't do a headset mic um, with the glasses and the number of hours I'm in Zoom. I end up with a horrible headache. I can't do earbuds because I still get my ears screaming in pain. Um, so I went ahead and invested in a better mic. Just I had already had one, but I started using it for all of this since I owned it already. And it sounds like my sound's pretty good, but I've never had a hard time hearing you, Bianca. Um, so if, I think you would only need to consider it if for whatever reason people are saying that there's a lot of interference with the microphone that is being used. Sometimes people are using, for example, a headset or earbuds and they have one in and one out. Um, and then like every time the one that's out like moves or brushes against something that causes like a little bit of background noise or it's only if something like that is happening where there's a distraction. Otherwise you probably don't need it. <laughs> um, oh, Thunderbolt 2 to connect to Spare TV. Thank you. All right. Uh, know, Elaine, you'll have to talk to me about your two screens. And it works. <laughs> Say that again, Ella. My son figured it out quickly and it just worked magic. Well, that's awesome, right? That's what you want. You want to just plug things in and they just work. <laughs> So a little bit ago, I was saying that it's not just sharing your screen. There's actually a lot more possible. And it comes just like everything with technology. That means it comes with both good and bad. So in your settings, this screen is from your settings. If you want students to be able to annotate on the screen you're sharing, you have to turn on annotation in your settings. When you do that, it gives you a couple of options. Do you want to allow saving of the shared screens with the annotations so that you can send those back out for kids to review or for kids who weren't there? Um, do you want it so that only the person who is sharing can annotate and nobody else can, which means typically the teacher and nobody else can? Here's why those are important, especially that second one, which I have turned off. So I'm sharing my screen right now. Let's see what happens. As it turns out, I have annotation turned on and I have it turned on for all of you. So if you find your Zoom toolbar where it says participants and da 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 da, you should see a green box that says you are viewing Nicole Naditz's screen. To the right of that, you should see view options. View options um, will then actually let me make sure I didn't turn it off in security. Hold on. Make sure it's on. It is on. Okay. Um, view options will give you the annotation toolbar as a participant. 
And you'll see that you could start typing on my screen. You could take a pen and draw all over my screen and I am inviting you to do so, so go ahead. Um, you can actually see there's Elaine. So Elaine has added a star to the screen. So find, there's a green rectangle that says you are viewing Nicole Naditz's screen. To the right of that is a black rectangle that says view options. Click on that and then it either says annotate or annotation. Click on that and you should get this toolbar that will allow you to type, draw as Daniel, Daniel is doing, um, and stamp <laughs> and so on. So if I asked you to, I could have you use the drawing tool. Oops, sorry, that was a screen share. I can't do it like that. I need to turn on my own toolbar. I could have you use the drawing tool to pick a wider line and you can even choose a different color. And I could say that I would like you to underline um, or, yeah, underline or circle all the words that are two syllables, right? And so then you have students who can now underline anything that is two syllables or circle, underline or circle, anything that is two syllables. So you can actually use this as an activity, right? Here's what you need to know. You might have noticed that anything any of you do, I can see immediately and so can everybody else. So this is not something to be done until you and your students have agreed to some norms for how we're going to interact in these spaces and you've already built enough trust and respect for each other as a learning community that you know that they will make good choices and not type or draw things that would be inappropriate because there's no way to unsee it. You could, you could like I could, I can immediately be like, oh my God, clear all the things, right? And I just got rid of everything. Um, that was on my toolbar. I can clear everything because I'm the person sharing and I'm the host. If you do clear, it's only, I believe you can clear your drawings, but you can't clear everybody's. Okay. My toolbar includes a save option as well for me to save the annotations. The other thing that happens is as you annotate, it does have your name by what you're doing. But as soon as you're done with that annotation, your name disappears and we don't know who did it anymore unless we memorized it. Okay, so I'm gonna turn off my personal annotations and check the chat. Oh, perfect, thank you. View options to the right. Yep, how to annotate. So find your Zoom tools, oops, sorry. Let me bring that back, I was not, hold on a second. <laughs> hold on, it'll come right back. Sorry, I have to move things out of the way. Okay, um, so Bianca, if you wanted to try that, it'll still be available on the next screen too, because it's available anytime I'm sharing a screen. Um, find your Zoom tools where it says things like participants and so on. And above or below that, attached to it, there should be a green, you are, um, you are viewing Nicole Naditz's screen. To the right of that, there's a black, small little rectangle with white font that says view options. Nicole, mine happens to be on the top of my screen. That's why I oh. said sometimes it's on the top and sometimes it's on the bottom. <laughs> yep. It just, it, it varies. Mine tends to be on the bottom, although I move it around. Perfect. And so while Bianca's annotating, I can see that she's doing it, but as soon as she stops that annotation and moves on, it's gone. And I don't, I can't go back and see who did it. Even if I try to select it, it won't tell me. But you can see that this does have some potential, right? This is a way you can engage learners in specific kinds of content if you give your learners a specific task. And they will be tempted. They're going to want to doodle. They're, you know, so it's something to think about, about do you want to give them a little bit of space to do that if you know you can trust them to not do anything inappropriate? Um, you can't take away tools, like you can't get it to where they can only draw, but they can't type or they just have the whole toolbar. They have the whole toolbar all the time if you turn it on and give it to them. And if you turn it on, it is turned on for any shared screen. That means you only did it because I told you to, but your kiddos are pretty curious. They're clicking around on that Zoom thing, trying to figure out what they can do. And kids can find it on their own without 
you have given it to them. So the other thing you can do is remember that you have a security icon. So now look, try to annotate now. You can't. I just took it away for this meeting for now. So I can click as the host. You don't see security for you because you're a participant. But when you're a host, to the left of the word participants, you have that little security badge. You can click on that and you can toggle having annotation on or off so that it's off until the minute you need it. It's turned on for an activity and then you can turn it right back off again. By the way, I turned it back on. Now notice I'm sharing my screen and you're annotating on my shared screen. So your annotations are still here, right? So I'm going to clear those annotations now. Give me a second. I'm going to clear those annotations. There we go. All right. A whiteboard is just a blank screen. So way back, make sure it's enabled in your settings if you want to do it. And then decide um, if this means hosts and participants can share a whiteboard. So again, this is a choice because even your students could share a whiteboard during a meeting if you've allowed students to have access to sharing to begin with. And in security, I'm trying to see, in security, you can turn off the ability of host, of participants, the students, to start sharing. So that's another on off. You can click that security badge and be like, uh-uh, you don't all get to share, it's my share. <laughs> you don't get to share. So I have it on because I need my participants to be able to share their screen sometimes when I'm helping them out with a tech problem. Um, in any case, the whiteboard will just allow you to share a blank white board. It's just a whiteboard. And then it works alongside the annotations tool so that you and your participants can type or draw on it. So if I stop this share and I share again and I choose whiteboard and I say share, notice that now your annotations probably showed up automatically, I think. They showed up for me. If they didn't show up for you, go back to view options and click on um, annotate, just like you did before. And now it's just a blank white board. So this can be helpful in breakout rooms, for example, um, where students now have a space where they can record um, their notes from their conversation. Right, and they just have a place to go to do that. Now, could you just send them a Google Doc to type on? You absolutely could and then they're all attached to that Google Doc possibly and so on. But otherwise it's the same annotation tools. Um, the format thing lets you change your colors so you can change your colors and so on. <laughs> oh yes, that Daniel found the um, spotlighting feature that you can use. It doesn't change, um, it doesn't permanently add content but it makes your cursor more obvious. Okay, so he's using the arrow one I'm using the little red dot. <laughs> okay. All right. I want to make sure we only have two minutes left and I definitely want to get to another one that we have available. So I'm going to stop that share. I'm going to go back to my other share because I had this ready. There we go. All right. Oops. And that's remote control. So remote control, this is actually broken into two pieces here. One is that in my, particip in my Zoom meeting toolbar, there's that security badge I keep talking about. When you are sharing your screen, you have a remote control button. It doesn't show up unless you're sharing your screen. And that screen could also be a whiteboard, but you have to be sharing something. And then if I click that, it's gonna pop up a list of participants and it's going to allow me to choose someone that I am giving mouse control to, okay? And then when I'm done and I don't want that person to keep, they're gonna be able to use my mouse to manipulate things on the screen. And I'll show you an example in a second. And then when that person's done, I click remote control again and I abort, it's very, very aggressive as a term. I abort control. Um, so that Nicole Kukral doesn't have control anymore and it's my mouse again. So I'm going to pop this out of full screen and we're going to see a sample here. So this is a primary grades example and it's not even that good of one, but it was the one I could think of fastest. You could do a Venn diagram and have little text boxes um, with words in them that you want the kids to move into different parts of the Venn diagram, for example. But let's just try this. Um, Elaine, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> I'm going to give you remote control 
and see if you can move an apple. Take my mouse, grab an apple, and move it into the basket. You should be able to, there you go. Nice. Now, before she does all of them and leaves nothing for anybody else, I'm going to abort her control. <laughs> I'm going to abort Elaine's control. Would someone else like to try the remote control feature? To see what it's like as a participant? Oh, you're all shy. Daniel okay. has his thumbs up. I think Daniel wants to try. Oh, perfect. Thank you. I'm looking at, oh, shoot. I didn't see that because I didn't have the grid. Yes, absolutely. Give me a second here. I'm going to make, give you, okay. You have control of my mouse. Go ahead and try to grab an apple and put it in the basket. <laughs> grab just the apple. There you go. There you go. Keep dragging. Drag and let go. Perfect. So obviously this might not be the task that you do with it, but this gives you a sense of students, as I said, like on a Venn diagram, they can be moving items to one category or the other or to the middle, or you can be sorting things. There's a lot of ways you can use this. Um, in theory, because he has my remote control, he can also add a new slide to my presentation, start typing away, <laughs> like he's got remote control. So if he goes over and, you know, clicks on the slide 17, like Daniel, do this for me on the left, click one time over where it's slide 17 um, in that left menu. Uh -huh, just click one time. Good. Now hit enter on your keyboard. It should work. I just want to see if, yep. So he just created a new slide. Um, this shows you my little magic trick, by the way. I saved all of this in master slide so that you actually can't you can't move the tree or the grass or the directions or the basket by accident. You can only move the apples. Anyway, so I'm gonna abort remote control, Daniel. <laughs> Thank you though, um, I'm gonna abort. And I just want you to know that your last slide currently has the using Zoom for live interactions. All of these things are in there with some more explanation and some more resources. And the recording of this particular training will be added here as well. So thank you. Feel free to email me anytime if you run into questions um, because that's totally natural. You're not supposed to remember all this. You're not even supposed to use all this, by the way. So don't only use the things that are meaningful to you and your students. Um, and that's it. Thank you.